one, two, three. We're back here at the Gill Athletics Track and Field Connections Podcast. I got too many words in that title. I got to figure out how to shorten that up. But you're here. I'm here. And our guest is here. And I'm really excited about this because uh, this guy, uh, is, this is a self-admitted quote from him. He's taken a non-traditional path to where he is today. And I love stuff like that, right? I love tradition, but I love doing things differently, awkwardly, weirdly, uniquely, Uh I think I just called him weird and he didn't even, he didn't even know it. Uh, so let's get into it. Let's find out. We've got the director of track and field at Averett university, the wise, the wonderful, help me welcome Matt Logan, Matt, how are you, sir? I'm good, Mike. Happy to be here. Um, and, and join you here for this conversation. You didn't realize that I would call you awkward and weird before we even hit the one minute mark. <laughs> I, I would have been offended if it wasn't true. Um, <laughs> But both things are true. So I'll there we go. Good. Hey, that's how you know you're real. Because you know the non-real person says, "Well, I'm not awkward. I'm not you know weird." It's like, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. We're humans. We're all in some form or fashion that way. And if you're not, you're you're probably kind of boring. <laughs> well, Matt, man, uh, you know you are. If this goes to plan, this is episode number one hundred and seventy-four. So we've got 174 guests here, including you now. Uh, and what we love to do here is, you know, our goal is simply to uplift and honor the track and field coaches of the world, really, but specifically here in America. And we do that by exploring your journey, right? There's your path to where you are today has been uniquely made. There's no two people who choose to be track coaches who get to where they are in the same form or fashion, right? So uh, we're going to just learn from you and kind of figure out uh, how you got to where you did, the people that poured into you, uh, the lessons learned, kind of the ups and downs, and uh, really just kind of, you know, honor you and in, in your journey here in this this great profession. So to do that, are, are you a, a Marvel or were you a comic book kid or anything growing up? I hate I hate to say that I was not and oh am my. not. Gosh. I know, I know. Yeah, I'm more of the, uh, I, I'm kind of more of the, the indie flick guys, so like Paul Thomas Anderson, those kind of movies, as opposed to the big superhero stuff and okay. comic book things. So well, sorry, sorry. Was, that's okay. I was a I comic know though. I'm guy. familiar. I'm yeah. familiar. I, I was a comic book guy, and my favorite part about comic books were the origin stories. Mm -hmm. So you know, how did Peter Parker become Spider Man, and how did um, Thor become who he is, etc. Right. So that's what I want to do with you. Let's kind of start with the origin story. Where does track coaching? start for you as like a profession like oh man like i could actually maybe do this for a living what did that idea spark for you yeah for sure so i'll answer that um in in two two ways so so one is like i think that everybody who is a coach had a coach that made them want to be a coach right um and so uh so for me, uh, my early years of high school, when, um, you know, found the love for, for track and field and cross country, um, I, I like thought deeply about, wow, like this person has had a, just such a profound impact on my life. Um, could, could this be something like to explore, right? Uh, professionally. Um, but I, I really wasn't serious about that, right? Like I, I sort of, I, I was pretty set on what I wanted to do for a living and, um, and, and uh, didn't think that I would be, I would end up coaching uh, track field, but I was always very interested in um, sort of the mentoring and in, in, in the coaching and the physiology and stuff like that uh, of the sport. Um, and, uh, and then sort of in my adult life, uh, I was sort of done with the sport after college. Like uh, after my undergraduate, I sort of washed my hands with it and was like, boy, um, and uh, not, not because of like, I had a bad experience or anything, but it was just like, right, it was just, I was good. Um, and then, uh, and then I, uh, I started working at, um, uh, like just a, a local running store as a graduate student. Um, and just being around the sport again and interacting with a lot of uh, high school athletes, I, I was, um, interested in seeing what this would be like, kind of helping out. Right. Um, seeing what that would be like, and I got connected with, uh, a local uh, high school team and started coaching and just like sort of just totally got wrapped back into it. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, I I do view it as sort of a calling, right? I try to like run away from this for a few different times, um, mm -hmm. and it and it constantly sort of pulled me back towards it. Uh, but but um, yeah, I, I was sort of doing a little bit of helping out, just ask, answering questions and working with some individual athletes when even when I was a graduate student. And, uh, as a grad student, I was officially attached to the uh, Carborough High School program right outside of Chapel Hill. Um, and like it, it's really, really rich high school uh, 
uh, cross country and track tradition there, like uh, cross town. Joan Nesbitt Mabe is one of the high school coaches, so it's like, oh, great! Like we get to <laughs> we get to run against uh, the former UNC coach. Um, this this be good. And uh, and Mimi O'Grady, who I worked under there, who I think does a fantastic job, but um, I won't get ahead of myself here. So so that getting there and just being with the people and and uh, being around the the student athletes every day was like, huh, like maybe maybe this is something I'm going to do or, or or reconsider, but. Um, that was sort of that, that spark, uh, right. It, it didn't sort of jump me into to full-time coaching at that point, but, um, it certainly was the spark for that. When you said every coach had a coach who helped, who, who helped them want to be a coach, you know, it was kind of their inspiration, right? Everybody who heard that instantly thought of, of that person or persons. So who was that for you? Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I say this carefully because I've had a ton of really awesome coaches that have really lived into me. Um, I, uh, I, I played a lot of sports growing up. Right. And I was not very good. <laughs> I worked really hard. We have a lot in common so far. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I got a lot of those like, Hey, you can defend and you can dribble. Just don't shoot the ball. Like, just don't, you know what I mean? Um, so, okay. See, uh, I got, I got you beat. Cause no one ever told me I could defend or <laughs> dribble. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you weren't that bad, but okay. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, and so I was sort of the, I was sort of always kind of the overlooked athlete, like even as a young person, right. Like always sort of like um, I, I played and, and was competitive, but I was never the guy or, or even one of the two or three the guys. Um, but I always was really close to my coaches. You know, um, I, I try to like always get kind of underneath the sport. Um, and uh, and uh, when I was in high school, um, I was named the captain of my cross country team my sophomore year of high school. And, and Coach Thorpe, Evan Thorpe and Mark Nelson were the two coaches. Coach Thorpe is still coaching um, in Dixon. He's now at the middle school level because his son is actually coaching at the high school level. Um, awesome, awesome guy. Still talk to him all the time. Talk to his son all the time. And uh, Mark Nelson was also the assistant coach there. But I, I would say, Evan, for me, like, um, it was the first time that anybody besides sort of my parents, like, really believed in me, mm. right? And, and knowing what that felt like was, like, the profound impact that that had on my life. And knowing, like, wow, like, that, that – and he probably didn't, like, see that sort of grand gesture. But, but that sort of thing, like, I, I felt like I was doing things the right way. In, in that uh, I remember we had a conversation one time and he was like, Hey, like, this is your team. Um, this is not my team. It's the whole team. And as the captain, like your team, so you get to shape the culture and we kind of get to be partners in this. And that was a little bit terrifying. Um, but also the, the ability to, to impact like me in that way. Um, it, it really had a profound effect on like, so, so I view myself as like, I get to be somebody who believes in other people. Mm. Um, and that's, that's my role as a coach, somebody who um, sometimes believes in other people more than they believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. And that was true uh, for Evan, for, for me. And, um, and I, I hope, I hope to do that to other athletes as well. So that was, that was the guy for me. Isn't that the real superpower of coaching, the ability to see something in others before they can see it in themselves? Yeah. And I think it's, um, uh, what I appreciated is it was, I felt like there were some intangible things that were seen um, because I certainly, like I, I was on a team with some really good athletes and I certainly was not the best athlete on, on the team. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it feels um, it's pretty unique to coaching, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's pretty like, uh, you know, it's, sometimes it can happen professionally. Right. But, but I think daily the idea that you get to like come to practice and, expect some things shows that you sort of believe that your athletes or the people that you surround yourselves can do it. So I think it's, it's pretty awesome. I'm sure there's an accountant out right now out there that says, man, my accounting teacher believed in me. I'm sure <laughs> there is, but traditionally it's parents and coaches. You're, you, you kind of nailed it there. You know, you said that, uh, you know, coach Evan was like the first person to really believe in you outside of your parents. And, and to me, like, I love that imagery. I mean, I love, especially, well, I guess not really knowing, but kind of knowing, getting ahead of myself here of, of your journey. But to me, that, you know, that that speaks to my heart of what I speak to 
towards coaches because sometimes, uh, and I'll stereotype typically uh, younger coaches when we get into track and we certainly get into it in the right, for the right reasons, but we really want, like, we don't, we don't feel like we have really made it as a coach until we've coached all Americans or all state athletes or studs, et cetera. And the reality is, first of all, the reality is most of us are not, they're just not that many in, in the aggregate for how many athletes we're working with. But the reality is no matter what the impact that you make on young people, the positive impact that you make on young people is worth it all. Like, you know, we're going to learn with your story that, you know, as not being that great of an athlete, maybe coach could, could have easily seen you and be like, yeah, Matt was just another kid on the team. You know, he went on to be a great carpenter or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But he poured into you as a human, as a person. And now you're going on to do other amazing things, pouring into other young people like, like Evans, coach Thorpe's legacy actually lives on through you because of what he did with you. And not because you were a superstar, because you were mad. <laughs> you were a, a kid on his team that deserved it. You know, I, I love that. That, that to me is the ultimate, like be where your feet are, whether you have two kids, 200 kids, two, five studs, no studs, whatever you define stud as be the leader for those young people that they need. You know, I, I love it, Matt. That's, that's awesome. We could cut the podcast right there and we just had an <laughs> amazing, I mean, seriously guys, rewind and listen to that. That is what you do. If you're a coach right now, that is what you should be striving to do. And I'm willing to bet because I know a lot of you out there uh, in the coaching world, that is what you are doing. Uh, okay. So you mentioned North Carolina and running and you're kind of done with it over. Where did you actually go to school? Uh, and what, what did you do then? If you kind of were over it, you, you said the running store, what, what did you move into professionally? Yeah, for sure. So uh, yeah, uh, ran high school was, was, was good. Not great. A high school athlete um, spent some time in the DePaul university program. So, uh, Andy Craycraft, who you've had on this podcast was the guy who actually recruited me. And, um, I haven't talked to Andy in, in a while, but he, he had a big impact on me too. Like he had some, um, he, even I, I, I did choose to transfer, uh, from DePaul to NAI Olivet Nazarene university. Um, and then, uh, I left Olivet and uh, I spent most of the time in uh, <laughs> in the training room there, not because my coaches, but because I was uh, uh, immature and uh, had a had a what, what you describe as an unhealthy ego, uh, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, s- sneaking in runs um, like uh, sometimes two, three times a day. Oh. And so, uh, yeah, 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 not. Uh, um, had some had some grown up to do, right? The, the opposite of uh, what you want now today as a coach. <laughs> I think about that sometimes, Mike. Like, man, I would have just been a nightmare for myself. Um, and hey, uh, hey, now that that's an interesting scenario. What if we could, uh, you know, with all this, um, you know, multiverse or not multiverse, but um, metaverse and all this stuff? What if you could actually like hop into the the metaverse and coach yourself as an eighteen or twenty year old? That, what a lesson that would be. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, I feel like I'd have been kicked off of a few teams. Um, you, you would have kicked yourself off. <laughs> that's right. Yes, that's right. So, uh, my, my coaches had much more patience for me than, than I have for, for others, which is a lesson in and of itself, I guess. But, uh, yeah, so had awesome coaches at both of those stops. Um, and I'd like to shout those out, um, right. Like at all that, uh, Kyle Rego, who, now back at he's the director now at Olivet uh, was the assistant there and then Mike McDowell who since retired was um, was the coach there and then Pat Savage and, and Dave Dopek were two of the coaches at uh, DePaul while I was there and um, and so yeah I, I left and um, I studied theology and political science at, at Olivet right and so uh, my my plan was to um, I, I wanted to go to to law school but also study theology. And so the, the plan was like to work for like the UN or something someday, right? Or, or be some sort of diplomat or um, foreign services or, or whatever. And so, um, and, uh, and so I, I went to, uh, went to graduate school at Duke. Um, and after the first semester there, I uh, did not want to uh, be a lawyer anymore. <laughs> and so um, I, I did a, what's called an MTS degree. So it's a master's of theological studies. So it's, it's not quite the, like most people, when they want to go into theology, they'll, they'll do an MDiv, right? Which is like sort of pastor training. Mm-hmm. Um, the Master of Divinity, I did the mm-hmm. MTS, which is more the academic track. I was, was going to do a PhD in in, uh, in theology, and so uh, so so yeah, studied a lot, learned a lot. I do think studying philosophy and theology helped make me a better coach um, in in some very particular kind of ways, like understanding systems and how one thing affects other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, 
but during that time, just to kind of, we were, my, my wife, we got married very young, right? So my wife and I were broke, broke and uh, in graduate school. And uh, to, to make some extra money, I started, uh, started working at a local running store. Um, and, uh, and that kind of bloomed into like a, a, bit, a larger career um, after graduate school. So, um, so, so yeah, do, doing some marketing community outreach there. And then eventually uh, got into working, working in the church. Um, working at First Presbyterian Church in, in Greensboro, North Carolina, um, which uh, big downtown church. I had an awesome, awesome experience there, and I'm, I'm still. Uh, that's where we attend, right? Still very, very connected with with that church. Teaching some Sunday school classes and things there too. So, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, that's not to get ahead of myself, but that's sort of how that um, that happened from from Illinois to to North Carolina. So, so North Carolina is kind of home now. Yeah, I've been been here for. Um, between eight, almost nine years now. Oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, uh, we, we love it. Like we, we love Durham. We were there and um, spent some time in Chapel Hill as well. And uh, in, in now Greensboro is a little bit of a, um, it, it's, it's awesome too, right? We, we love it. It's a little bit of a tougher town, which we kind of like. Um, and, uh, and um, it's, it's, it's a good spot for us and um, have, have three children that we're raising here. I'm happy to do it because it's a, it's a great spot. You mentioned, so after the running store, you kind of started, I, I, I didn't understand if it was volunteering or assistant coach, but you started working for a high school. What was that like the first time you kind of not even got back into coaching? This was kind of your first taste of actual coaching. What was that like? Yeah, it felt, um, it felt like it was where I belonged. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, I guess I felt like a native speaker um, hmm. and, and, uh, and was able to work with someone who was really patient with me as I got back into it and sort of uh, transitioned from thinking about things as an athlete, thinking about things as a coach, which are, which are really different. Um, and, uh, and, and that, like I said, that was sort of the spark where it was like, it was sort of like, maybe, maybe I have to do this. <laughs> Um, and, and sometimes I have to do this is outweighs I, I want to do this sometimes because it's a lot of long hours and, um, and you get beat up a little bit, and, uh, but that's okay. Like it's, it's sort of a very, very special sort of sacred thing, right? Coaching, especially coaching track and field and cross country. So, um, yeah, we're, worked at Carborough high school, which is a, um, kind of a, not, not a big school, not a small school, um, but they've won Mimi O'Grady is the head coach there. They've won, you know, a handful of state championships in cross three and they're, they're really, really good on the women's side. And um, Mimi told me one time, she said, if you really want to do this, you have to stop being such a dude coach. Um, oh, and that was, that? what does she mean by that? Yeah. yeah. Right, 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 right. I knew exactly what she meant. Um, were you like going, where, you're not from California. You weren't going around <laughs> like hang loose and do this and do that. Were you? No, no. I, I think, I think it's just like, um, I think something that Mimi is really, Coach O'Grady is really, really good at is she talks about the Rubik's Cube a lot, right? And so coaching is not an imposition. Um, it's not imposing what you think um, on a situation. It is sort of like a, a relationship and finding out uh, how to not, not solve, like that's not a, that's a reductive way to look at it, right? But, but how to work with each particular athlete. And I've never seen somebody that's more um, just emotionally intelligent among young women athletes hmm. um and, and and great with great with the young men too but expect like those women those young women just believed like they just believed in her so, like it was it was wild it was wild to see her sort of workers like sorcery <laughs> um and uh and um they do anything for, like got to a point where they do anything for her, but it was because she didn't expect them to she she wanted to honor um you know their their desires and their wants too. So, so I learned a ton from her just about the, the relationship building and the emotional side of coaching. Hmm. Um, and, uh, was a really, really good little, and I was there very briefly like, for a season. So, but it was a very, very good, um, sort of, uh, coaching one oh one right. Uh, kind of entry, uh, entry point into it. It's not all about the physiology. It's not all about the X's and O's. Hmm. Um, it's not all about talking about the post on, um, I won't say names, but websites. Um, the, the <laughs> and oh, uh, you, you can say it. It's everybody's favorite, <laughs> not favorite website. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 
yeah, you know, I'm on there. So it's, it's fun, but you know, it's, I, I admit to... I'm on there. I'm on there for <laughs> one thread a year. It's the coaching thread. That's the only thing I'm on there for. Right. Right. So, so yeah, that, that's, um, I think that's kind of what you meant by a dude coach, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like, Hey bro, what's your PR, right? It's like, mm -hmm. let's, let's find out. Um, uh, let, let's, let's, uh, stand alongside these athletes and, and go on a journey with them together and, and really get emotionally invested into their lives and see them as, as whole people and not um, just runners. And so I think um, that, that really, I knew that, right. But I had to be reminded of it. Um, people had done that in my life, but it was sort of like seeing it, um, seeing it up close on the other side for the first time. Somebody who does it really, really well was, was great. Really great. We've had this kind of conversation in several different forms throughout the episodes here on the podcast. Uh, you had mentioned about, you know, transitioning from athlete to coach uh, with Cameron Babb, head coach of Washburn. We talked about, you know, when you're an athlete, when information is given to you, it's a very selfish act, meaning, you know, you're trying to take in what coach says and how do I get better off of it when you become a coach and you receive info. So whether you're at a seminar, you're talking with a peer, you're at a coaching education event, it's self less you're trying to take that information and now how do i spit it out to my athletes uh, a couple of weeks ago we had a new director of track and field at kent state nathan fanger and he talked about you know when he first started it was kind of like 10 percent people 90 percent the the articles the science the you know the and for his case for throwing you know when to lift this when to throw that and now he's learned and become a better coach because he's he's flipped it it's like 90 percent about the person that they're working with and 10 percent of the technique and things like that how did you and, and maybe it progresses past working with coach mimi rogers during that time as you're you're kind of still figuring this out how did that transition happen for you did it was it a fast transition was it slow what what eventually kind of hit you up in the head and was like, oh man, you know what? I'm in the people business first and foremost. Yeah, you know, um, physiology is 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 complex, but it's technical, right? Like you can kind of figure it out. People are people mm -hmm. are complex in a different way. Like people are complex because they're um, uh, they're they're they but they bring something different to practice every day, and uh, and you're accountable to them. Right. And, and so like, I don't think of myself as accountable to the physiology or accountable to the X's and O's. Um, I think like you do need to know what you're talking about, like as a, just a baseline, like you do really need to know what you're talking about. But, um, but my ministry really helps with this <laughs> working, working with people in ministry and, um, and, and sort of walking with them through some, some awesome times, but also some really dark times too, um, really helps to know that uh, everybody had a different experience leaving home that day. Mm. Like everybody got a different grade on a test that day at school. Like everybody has a different situation going on at home. And, and it's, it's like, I think sometimes coaches talk about this and I don't think they mean this, but they talk about it as like getting to know the person is a pathway into their athletic endeavors. It's like, well, no, that's not really what it's about. Right. Those things are always sort of joined. Um, like a, you know, like a helix, right. Is like, um, I think of, I think the, the belief is like a cycle where right, like if that athlete knows that you believe in them and you want the best for them as a person, right. Uh, they're going to reciprocate that belief and do, you know, they'll be your person. Like they'll be your, they'll be your guy or your girl. Like they'll be your, um, I'm saying in a weird way, like they'll do what they tell you to, they'll trust you. Um, and, and when you get into that like sort of place, it's rare, I think, um, but it, it uh, it's sort of a sacred kind of coach athlete sort of relationship. And, and um, I learned it from um, just applying what I learned from like, you know, customer service marketing it, it into and, and ministry as well to, to be present with other people. But it, it's, it's something you have to learn how to do, you know, and, and, uh, and, and I wish I was better at, it. and sometimes I will be doing my commute home and think, boy, I blew that, right? Like, boy, that person really needed me to, to be there for them. And I sort of told them to go ice or something, you know, what, whatever it is, you know, what I mean? and um, it, usually it's not, it's not about what it's about um, when there's, mm. when there's tension, you know? Well, and so, uh, tell me more about that. It's not, it's not necessarily always about what it's about. Yeah. Like uh, when you have expectations and rules, it's like as a coach, sometimes like, Oh, these people are meeting or not meeting these things. And it's like, okay, like 
take another step, like <laughs> get underneath the, get underneath to the why, mm-hmm. um, and, and try to, uh, and try to connect. Um, because if you're not able to, like, it just, it's not going to work out, right? Like it just becomes an echo chamber and you're not really talking to a person you're talking to like, uh, um, you know, something you're trying to like impose yourself on or, or impose yourself upon and, and, um, it becomes less of a relationship. Um, and so I think, uh, Right. Like knowing, um, yeah, knowing that somebody missed a practice or somebody was late and, and, uh, they need to be on time and they need to be there. Right. But finding out the why, right. Is, is incredibly, incredibly important to, to try to get underneath things, I think. And, and usually, usually you can, um, you can deduce uh, a problem that is much more complicated, uh, than you once suspected. Um, has to do with mental health or confidence or um, right a, a relationship that fell apart or, or whatever. And as coaches, uh, you're you're a coach and you're also sort of a social worker. <laughs> um, Have you yeah. heard of the principle Y times five? I, I've heard of it, but um, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with it. Yeah, you're, you're kind of describing it. So when you said what presents as the problem is typically not the problem. So I, I think about this late for practice thing. So why were you late? Well, I missed the bus to get to the track or whatnot. It's like, Oh, you got, you know, well, gosh, dang it. You got to be at the bus on time. That's surface level. That was the problem. Uh, there's a principle of when a, a problem is presented to you, you know, asking why. And then when that answer is given, well, why was that? And then when that answer is given, why is that? And typically by the fifth, why you can actually get to what the real root of the problem is, which is what we talk about a lot as coaches anyway, right? Like how, how do I solve the root of the problem? Not the, you know, 10 feet above the ground here. So, you know, I missed the bus. Oh, well, you know, why, what happened there? Uh, well, you know, my car broke down. Oh, well, what happened there? Well, my, um, significant other didn't you know pay their rent on time and so we couldn't afford the car and now they're leaving and i'm up the creek or what you know oh well, why haven't there and you actually get to find the problems like oh they have an unstable housing life right now and relationship life that's why they really miss practice and maybe practice is a little less of a priority right now because of all these other things that's kind of as you were saying that you know the, the problem is not necessarily always the problem that, that's kind of what made me think about you know asking why that's that's actually the second time you've talked about you, you've used the um, descriptor of getting under. You talked about when you were in high school as an athlete, you like to get under the coaching. Uh, and now you're talking about getting to the athlete and getting under. Are, are you using that as a metaphor of like understanding the why behind it, not just the, okay, go run five by one mile. Okay, make sure you're at practice at three o'clock. What the actual why and reason behind things are? I think so. And, and also um, a, a it's also a self reminder of like why we're doing what we're doing um, in a very sort of technical way, but, but also um, uh, in, in a, in a personal way too, right? Like it's like being a 16 year old kid and your coach is telling you to run like 70 miles a week is, is not an easy thing to do. Right. It's not like, and so, uh, so I, 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 um, something my, my, the athletes that I've worked with get so sick of me saying, and I said all the time, is like running is not about running right um or track and field is not about track and field m- meaning that um hopefully we're not doing this just to run fast and throw things far and jump far right and jump high right we're we're um it's it's sort of a conduit to to experience life and so um or a vector right to experience uh life together and so i i i wanted to really understand um the values that different coaches that I had had. And I had somebody that when I was really young and running, that was really important to me. His name was Kel Bond, division three guy, middle distance runner. And he was from my hometown. Right. And uh, the way he talked about running and track and field was as if it was like some sort of uh, secret club. <laughs> I, I think about it in terms of a lot about like how uh, stand up comedians talk about being a stand up comedian. Um, right. Like, you just wanted to be one of those guys, you know, like when I see really special coaches and, and I see um, those conversations that happen at meets on the infield and I'm just like an athlete. And it's like, I wonder what they're talking about. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I think that's what I mean by like, underneath of it. Right. I wanted to be, um, I, I wanted to be a conversation partner in what seemed to me to be a very internal conversation mm. um, amongst track and field coaches. And, um, 
uh, and I think all, all coaches at, at, at most levels. Right. And I think I really got a lot. I, I mean, I'm sure I annoyed a lot of coaches cause I did constantly ask like why we're doing what we're doing. Um, but I think it, it was also, it, it was like real curiosity. Um, I, 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 I think I'm a pretty curious person. And so I really kind of want to get to the, like you said, the root of things or, or the bottom of things. Um, I think about it in a little bit different terms of like sort of upstream downstream, you know, like sort of what you put in the water up top is like going to float down. Hmm. Um, and so trying to find out what's being put in the water up there or, or, or what's, you know, what's falling into the river um, and, and how that sort of matriculating downstream um, I think is, uh, is, is what I was curious about, right? Like what, what, uh, what's happening sort of at the source hmm. um, and, and how can I be a, a, an actor in this conversation? Um, and, uh, and it made track and field really cool. <laughs> you know it made it feel like these these coaches had all these secrets and things you know and so um i really like that aspect of it and then i found out that nobody knows anything you know yeah so that's what i say we're <laughs> we're all just making our best guesses here exactly uh well let's continue down the stream yeah. where did after you had a, a pretty i don't want to overstate it maybe and say life altering but a pretty impactful time with coach mimi rogers there what was the next step yeah, and sorry, it was Mimi O'Grady. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry, but O'Grady. but a Rogers sorry. will come up down the okay. road. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, Coach Rogers will come up down the road. Yeah. So um, so when we were in uh, Durham, uh, uh, Annie, my wife, is cre- an incredibly talented artist person. Uh, she went to school for fashion design and merchandising. She got this killer, uh, this this amazing job offer in Greensboro, which is sort of a very it's a big textiles hub, mm-hmm. um, huge textiles hub, right? Um, and, uh, and so she got this, um, this amazing job offer and, and she sort of talked about it offhand one day and, and we were expecting our first child as well during this time. And so I was, um, I was like, well, Hey, like, like how serious are you about this? And, and we had a conversation about it and, um, and it was, it was sort of only like 45 minutes up the road. So it wasn't like we were moving our lives for some totally different place and leaving, leaving a bunch of our relationships and our friends. Um, and that was in Greensboro. So I, I asked her and she was like, well, what will you do? And I was like, I'll find something to do. Right. Like I'll, and and that's when I started applying to, to churches, um, Mm. in, in the Greensboro area. And, uh, and so we moved to Greensboro for, for her job. And, uh, and I kind of got my, uh, my beak wet in coaching and I, I'm so embarrassed to say this. Uh, my first day on the job, my, my, the executive pastor at the church I was at was, a uh, long time ago, I'll make fun of him, not that long ago, but long time ago, he was a 400 meter hurdler at, U- at the University of Virginia. Oh, wow. Um, and so I think I only got the job there because I talked about track and field and cross country <laughs> in the interview. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Just wanted a training partner, you know? Um, <laughs> so uh, so uh, moved to Greensboro, started working at the church. In my first conversation, my first day, I was like, hey, Neil, like, who are people I can reach out to about coaching here in Greensboro? <laughs> and he gave me, he gave me a couple of names and I text those people and I said, Hey, can, uh, can we meet for coffee? And I literally, the first day I started, I met for coffee about an assistant coaching job at a high school that day, that day. And that was at, um, that was at page high school in Greensboro, down, downtown high school. And I started and, and I just wanted to be around the sport. And so, um, they, uh, um, uh, very, very good, well coached program, uh, traditional program, Leanna blue, her uh Leanna Blue and her father was the assistant David Blue at the time. Um and um I was like, hey, like I'll take splits. I don't care, right? Like I'll um I'll set up a tent, you know, like I just want to be around the sport. And uh, so it was totally unpaid, right? Uh volunteer thing. Um and then once I uh and it's a very big program, big public school, big diverse public school downtown Greensboro. Um and uh once uh had had some really some success and some really great athletes come through that place too. But uh, once I, uh, I started there, I was just hooked, man. Like it was just over. And uh, that's when my wife used to joke with me that like my unpaid uh, volunteer high school coaching job was my full-time job. And my job <laughs> at the church was my, my part-time, my side hustle, uh, which is not, which is not true. Um, but, 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 you know, um, and, and so that, that season was, uh, was awesome. And, and at the end of that year, uh, Leanna was uh, having a child, a change in her life, and and she came and talked to me, and and she just said, "Hey, I think you should be the head coach. I think you should be the head coach." 
Um, and I talked to her dad, David, um, and uh, he was the head track coach. I became the head cross coach at the time. Um, and then uh, that's when things real. that's when it started to feel like, this is what I, this is just what I want to do. Like, this is what I'm called to do. This is what I should be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said to you when we talked last time that like when coaching felt more like ministry than ministry did, mm-hmm. um, that's when it was like, and, and obviously like we're not doing Bible study in public school coaching, but you, you get to care about people. You get to really care for people and, and, and love people. And, uh, and so uh, that's when I was like, um, hmm, let's see, let's see where this goes. <laughs> you know, let's, let's see where this goes. And, um, and so I spent uh, three uh, really great years at, at Page and um, had some really, really great athletes and lo- loved. I mean, we had a couple of teams there. Can I tell a story about an athlete really quick? Absolutely. Okay. So um, I, I sometimes get emotional talking about this because it's just, I, I joke that, you know, I joke that there's two kinds of coaches, coaches that have their favorite athletes and coaches that are lying. Um, um, and so uh, uh, there's this young man and he, uh, I'm not going to say his name because I don't have permission to, um, but uh, we had two two guys on that team who, well, three guys on that team who are now division one runners, um, really good guys. And, uh, and and one, two young ladies on that team who are division one runners right now as well. Uh, one's a division one soccer player. One is a division one runner, mid, middle distance runner. And um, I started there. There's this guy who loved to run, but he was like a 26 minute 5k guy, you know? And when I took over the head coaching job, I like did something that I don't do anymore, but I sent out these like surveys. And one of the questions on the surveys, cause we had a lot of like dual sport guys, like the cross players, whatever, do, just kind of running cross. And I wanted to kind of change that aspect of it, change that culture. Um, and uh, I sent out the survey. This sounds like something like in a, you know, like a Disney movie or something. I sent out the survey and one of the questions on the survey was like, how, how hard do you want to be pushed? Right. One to 10. And this young dude who ran 26 minutes in the 5k, crossed out 10 wrote 11 next to a circle there um and he did he got 11 and uh and i i love him to death and i always talked about how he was the tone setter for that team Mm. and he was our fifth guy he was our fifth man um on that team and we had you know three division one guys on that team Mm. um and uh he's he's attending he's not he's not running he's doing some club stuff i think for for nc state but he's attending nc state right now and um and uh he those are the kind of guy, the, the kind of athletes that I wanted to work with. Um, and those other people were great. I don't want to minimize like the effort that they put into, but, uh, but it's, it's really, it's, it's easier to run. I think 16, 70 miles a week when you're getting medals hung around your neck every weekend at the invitationals. Mm-hmm. But when you're a 26 minute guy and, and you drop from 26 minutes to a mid 17, 5k guy, um, it's harder to want, go on to run 70 miles a week. And he was like, what, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? So he uh, he started at 26 and maybe the connection messed up there. He went to (laughs) seven, 17 and a half. Yeah. 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 And and, you know, he did not heartbreaking, heartbreaking, heartbreaking. Um, He did not run his senior season because of um, the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. And and so he, um, but uh, really, really, really special group of athletes. And, and that team was really influential talk about coaches being influential, which is certainly true. That team and the way those, how close those people were and, and how amazing those people were was really like just amazingly influential on me. Like, this is what I have to do, right? Like this is, this is the only thing I want to be doing. I, I find that really interesting because we're talking about a 16, 17, 18 year old kid. Right? They're kids still here in high school, no matter how mature mm-hmm. or uh, wherever they are in their, their life stage, you know, I'm the kind of kid that probably if my coach would have given me that type of survey as a high schooler, I probably also would have crossed out 10 and added 11, but I didn't mean it. <laughs> I'd have been like, yeah, more like a five or a six boss, but I'm going to be funny and do that. It sounds like not only did he do that and meant it, but received it. Cause it's one thing to get pushed and you know, go from 20, if you told me 26 to 21, I'd be like, well, that's amazing. I mean, honestly, that's like, that's just an amazing job. We, we, we tend to sometimes with track because we deal with, uh, uh, you know, above average to really good athletes. Like we sometimes, sometimes poo poo what, you know, normal people can do And 21 minutes for a 5k. That's not easy. Go, go look at your local 5k and see how many people don't run better than 21 minutes. So if that kid would have been 21, I'd be like, oh, that's amazing. You know, but then, he went down to 17 and a half. That's rarefied air. 
Uh, I know there's plenty of people faster, but 17 and a half is rarefied air. So not only did he like mint, like, hey, push me, like I am here for it, but he received it. He meant it. He took it and turned it into results. Like that had to be like, if I'm the 15 minute guy, you know, number one, number two, number three guy, I'm looking at that going like, like, well, okay, hold on. I know I may be more talented. I may be running faster, but what's he got that I don't. Cause he, he's, he's getting a huge improvement here. Yeah. And I, I think is a good, like, it's such a gift to a coach, right? Because I think like you always want to celebrate the right things. Um, and you want to celebrate amazing athletes. Of course, like we all want to celebrate that. Like the, uh, the, the, the big class. So in North Carolina, there's four classes, right? And the big class two mile state champion was on that team. Um, oh, and wow. I talk about, and, and he is amazing. Like I, I can't, like it's, it seems like I'm talking down, like I'm not all these athletes who are on this, like almost all of them, like you know, they were, we had some awesome, awesome people in that group. But um, I think it's important kind of like how you, what you celebrate the program. Mm. And, um, and I'm super proud of that guy who won that state championship, but I'm just as proud of that other dude. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I am like, because it was inspired. It helped, you know, just, geez, sure. I mean, it just helped so much to see him like kind of come slowly sort of increase and, and come through the, from literally being the, the last guy through the shoot um, to, uh, you know, being a, a contributor on some, some really, really good teams. And so, mm-hmm. uh, so man, it was. Uh, I, I I think about that all the time, and like um, when there's some hard days, it's like I get to do that, right? Mm-hmm. Like I get to be part of that whole thing, um, which is which is really really neat. And so uh, so yeah, I, I just that that team specific, like you said, it's it's incredible. 15, 16, 17, 18 year old, the the kind of impact they can have on like a, an adult's life, and, mm-hmm. and though that group really sort of like put the nail in the coffin to like this is all I want to do. Like, I just want to be working with athletes and I want to be um, working in track and field for the rest of my life. And, and that's what made it happen. How do you, knowing that we don't talk X's and O's, but I'm curious, yeah. you know, it's such an amazing improvement. Let's call it 10 minutes, 26 down to 17. I'm from Alabama. So that probably is 10 in my math world. So we're just <laughs> going to call it 10, but that's amazing. Right. So, and I, I don't know that it's necessarily um, uncommon, maybe that drastic is uncommon, but high school coaches and even college coaches, every season we see the kid go from 21 minute 5k to 17, uh, 11, three in the hundred to 10 99, you know, these huge chunks. How did you, again, not X's and O's, mm-hmm. but on a philosophy type of, of basis, how did you, as that kid kept getting better, you know, you, especially in distance running, right. You're, you're writing a lot of workouts of like repeats and stuff, and you're basing those on either race pace or, um, I'm talking out my butt here. Cause I'm not a distance coach, but you know, maybe Jack Daniels formula, et cetera, but you're based not off of some kind of PR. So you're, you're based not off of like the 26 minute PR, but at some point he was running like at 23 minutes before he actually did it on the track or on the course. So you didn't know that he was a, an officially a 23 minute guy. How do you work? you know, he's probably killing workouts. How do you know when to, to cut the times down and, and when not to, by the way, just because they're running faster doesn't necessarily mean add more volume and things like that. How, how do you such a drastic change in PRs through the year and years? How do you work that in your workouts without talking with X's and O's? <laughs> yeah. 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 I think, no, I, I think um, sort of, sort of talking generally is like, it takes a kid that writes 11 next to it to sort of do that. Right. Mm-hmm. To, to kind of, to not be freaked out when like, um, you know, that athlete starts running like, you know, 15 mile long runs faster than his like 5,000 current 5,000 meter race pace. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you're just like, Whoa, like what's going, but he can do it. Like they, they can do it. And, um, and, and also just checking in with like constantly, like how, how's it going? Like, how are you feeling? Mm. um is is and so i think that having that relationship and and being pretty particular about the kind of um the kind of person that would you could even do that with and and not to get freaked out by that because you're right like there were times when it was like hey like and and i was like well hey if you're running a pr like that's not really a threshold (laughs) if you're not running a threshold run you know um and so uh but but he um but this person in particular like it, it happened so quickly because of course, like, you know, there was definitely potential there to, to run those times. It wasn't like he was a, he was a 26 minute guy. Cause he just wasn't doing, doing much. Right. And, and so, uh, 
it, but I think it's also um, that constant encouragement where you're you're calling out like personal best and and calling out like uh, celebrating the right things, you know, like whether that's hitting volume marks or, or hitting mark because it encourages athletes. If you're just always talking about your top athletes, um, I don't think you'll have that because it's like, well, the coach doesn't really value sort of what I bring. Um, and so uh, c- celebrating, celebrating the right things and, um, and, and making sure that, because it holds your, your, your better athletes accountable. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, Oh, the c- coach is talking about this person. And I'm, you know, w- what is he seeing there that, maybe I'm not doing right. And so I know I'm getting away from your question a little bit, but um, I think it's, I think it's happened. I just, I just um, read that uh, Chris Derrick at retirement that Chris Derrick just did. And, and he talks about kind of being where he was as a freshman in high school and progressing. And, um, and, and I, but I think it's a lot of the, the, the athlete willing to do it too. Like the athlete, you know, uh, taking on that challenge and not sort of being freaked out by running a long run at their, <laughs> what, what used to be sort of their 5,000. Uh, personal best and and that certainly was the case with with Hayden but it happened quickly um so I don't know if that really answered your question I guess it's all to say like I, I you know Mike I don't know I'm just making this up as I go uh, <laughs> I'm kidding hey join the club buddy <laughs> <laughs> so this is obviously a really fun time coaching I mean you know winning's fun right winning is hard but when you're in the mix of winning and, and you define winning it doesn't necessarily mean you're winning state titles and uh, state two, uh, two mile titles and stuff, which you, you are during that period, but you know, kids improving, that's winning, you know, culture being built, that's winning. Uh, you said you spent three years there. Why in the world would you have left? Oh man. Um, you know, uh, I think that reflecting on that recently is, um, I wanted to do this full time, right? And uh, there are some high school jobs in the country that allow you to do that. And I don't, I'm not a teacher. I don't have my teaching license. I, I could have sort of gone that route. Um, but I, I felt like this is all that I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And so I was sort of looking, but, but I, I, um, man, I have to tell you, it was really brutal. Like it was, um, I, I tell in, in every interview that I, that I do like for, for jobs or things, I, I, one of the things I say is like, you know, I cry at the banquet every year. <laughs> so be prepared for that. And uh, man, that there was a lot of uh, tears shed when I told the team that, um, that it was, and it, and it was, it was, it was really hard uh, because I loved it. I love those. I love those student athletes. I love the people that were surrounded that, that surrounded that program. Uh, I, I, I knew that I, um, that if I wanted to be able to do this full time, um, and, and put all sort of my, my entire focus into this, that I needed to make a change. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and I, and trust me, I thought about like, I'll start, let's start a track club and let's, you know what I mean? And, um, uh, but, but I, like I said, I, uh, if I, I, I had two children at the time, right. So if I want to do this full time, there wasn't a lot of like, um, hey, give me 18 months to see if we can get this mm-hmm. thing going, <laughs> this track club going. Um, it was more like, uh, like let's let's see what kind of opportunities are are out there. Um, and so, uh, so I kind of entered the the collegiate ranks and started doing it on a full time basis for, um, in a, in a sort of a strange way, right? Uh, the um, the coach at the University of North Carolina Greensboro at the time, uh, Chad Pearson, who's now at NC State. Um, he, he left UNCG for NC state and he's, he's a great guy. Like I, I just met him at the Sir Walter, like formally met him. I talked to him before, but formally met him at the Sir Walter Myler. Um, and he's, he's, he's great. Um, and it'd be hard not to join that NC state program uh, with the success that their women have had and their men, the men are good too. Um, and, uh, and so UNCG had an opening and so they elevated the assistant to the interim head and somebody at NC state actually told me that this had happened before coach Pearson had announced they're, they're like, you know, it's track and field things get out, right. Everybody's so close. Like everybody knows everybody. Um, and so, uh, I reached out to the, the athletic director at that time at, at UNCG and was like, Hey, I'm in town, you know, like, uh, I have some division one, uh, uh, experience as an athlete, like had some success coaching at the high school level and, um, and, uh, and, um, had kind of went, di- didn't think like, I'd have a shot, honestly, like didn't think like I would 
like who am I? Right? I'm a nobody, right? So, um, and and throughout the process, I uh, met with uh, the interim head coach, who's who's there doing an awesome job right now um, at UNCG, uh, Kaylee Roach, and um, and we just sort of clicked. It just sort of worked out, you know. And so, uh, so yeah, man, I I, I um, it, going from sort of just entering high school and only spending like really three years at the high school level mm -hmm. to getting sort of a, you know, a, a division one assistant job is uh, I'm incredibly thankful for that opportunity because I know it doesn't happen very often. Like I know that that's pretty rare. Um, and it should not have been as hard of a decision as it was because it was, I was super passionate about it, but those students at page and those student athletes at page made it a brutal decision. Mm -hmm. Um and um, I, I mean, I love those people. Like I, I love those people dearly. And, and, uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, ended up, ended up joining the, the uh, staff at, at UNCG as an assistant. And, um, and I think I, I left, right, because I had a lot of encouragement from mentors and, and, and my wife, right? Like, this is what, like, I can tell, like, this is the thing for you. Like, this is what you should be doing. Um, and um, you should go for it. Like you should really go for it, make this your full time thing, and um, and uh, and so so yeah, but but I still stir on that because uh, you know, like I was cool that there's athletes that are still in that high school program that um, that I you know I'm on mile split all the time, right? Looking at it, you know what I mean? It's just like it's it's just making sure that they're being taken care of because I I really love those kids and and um, had have all, nothing but good things to say about them. So, um, but that's a that's a good question. <laughs> Why do you think, you know, you, you have experience to look back on now. You said earlier that, you know, it's fairly rare a high school coach gets the shot at a college level job if they want it. Uh, and I've always been like, I don't, I don't understand it either besides just pure bias of like, Oh, well, you haven't done college. And it's like, well, if coaching is number one to you as far as hiring, then let that speak for itself, no matter what level, maybe harder on the high school level because of all the other stuff and teaching if you're a teacher, et cetera. But why, why do you think that's such a, uh, a rare um, uh, opportunity, rare opportunity when a high school coach gets to, to move up to the college ranks? I think because convention is easy and mm. curiosity is hard. Mm. You know, I think that, um, I think that convention uh, oh, this is sort of how the way it goes, right? You you spend time in a program. You're you know, it's, it's sometimes it's unique to the division. Oh, you're you're a division two athlete. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you become a division two GA, and then you become a division two assistant, and then you become a division one head. Coach. Like it's sort of like a very um, sort of conventional approach. And, and by the way, like that has worked out pretty well for a lot of people. Um, but um, but I think that um, I'm very uh, um, I'm very happy that. And, and also, I think there, there's been really good results of giving high school coaches chances. Uh, but it's a different thing. I mean, it's you're right. There, there's there's harder and easier things about both the different jobs. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yeah, I, I think that uh, like if you can coach, you can coach, right? Like you, you know, whether that's at the community college level, Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three high school, middle school, right? Like you, can, if you can coach, like you, you can coach. And so um, I, I, but I think, I think that's it, right? Is that like, there's sort of a pattern and uh, administrators or better coaches look at this and say like, uh, oh, well, do, do they check these sort of boxes? Okay, let's get them in. Uh, I've been really, really fortunate that the folks who have hired me have not followed that pattern because I wouldn't have a job. Um, you know what I mean? So, uh, so yeah, I, I think, um, I think, I think some programs are missing out though, right? Like to give more high school coaches some opportunities. So should, should more high school coaches be given those opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, but it, things are, I think the landscape is changing a little bit though, too, where, um, you, you know, some of these assistant jobs, like we gotta be paying coaches more, right? Like some of these assistant Amen. jobs. Amen. You know, Amen. you know what I mean. It's like it's it's hard to make a life in some cases versus oh, I'm a teacher, I have a teaching salary, and I can coach and I can do what I love to do. And like I know a lot of coaches, they're they're passionate teachers and they're passionate people. But <laughs> let's be real, right? They're 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 coaching um, is their sort of reason for teaching. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, uh, and they put their heart into both of those things. But, uh, but, but I think that as that sort of the, the scales kind of tip, I think that there are some, some high school jobs that maybe be our better jobs hmm. than um, some assistant college jobs. And so, uh, so I, I don't, I don't get pigeonholed with thinking like, Oh, like this person's a better coach because they're here, 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 because you've been around long enough. And I, you know, we know that that's, you know, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't make as much sense as it's sort of talked about as it does. It just doesn't, you know? And so, um, so I, I was, I was glad that, uh, um, that a very <laughs> high level high school coach just got an opportunity to power five conference. I was glad to, to see that. And, um, and I think it, it should happen um, more often, but uh, who, who's to say, like, who's to say that those high school coaches that are re- running really successful programs just don't want to stay there. Right. Mm-hmm. And run their programs and, and do an awesome job there too, because they're, they're certainty out there and they're doing awesome things. So in, in your reference in Newport, Newport or New Park? I can't remember the name of the school. Newberry Park. Yeah, New, yeah, yeah. Newberry yeah. Park. Mm-hmm. Going to UCLA, correct? Yeah, right. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was like the most amazing high school team ever. So uh, if that guy didn't get a chance, it's, it's kind of like, <laughs> all right, no one's getting a chance here. Come on, man. I know. Yeah. It's like, I have no hope, man. If that guy yeah, can't yeah, yeah. That guy I'm can't like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. it's funny when, like, when that happens, and, you know, we mentioned our favorite website. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's all the, you know, well, can he coach on the college level, et cetera? Well, you know, I've, I've done 100. 70 plus interviews here and 99% of the coaches say that, you know, we're in a people business first. So whether that per, that people person is 18 years old or 22 years old or what have you, I, I just don't understand how, like, we're not talking about, you know, uh, elementary school, like, oh, okay, how you deal with a uh, third grader, that, that certainly might be different than you deal with a sophomore in, in college. But we're talking about the same people going to the same school, you know, high school to college transition. Uh, and, and every high school coach we've had here on the podcast, and we've had, you know, national high school coaches of the year. Um, you know, we had a couple of, you know, real small school Kentucky high school coaches. Um, you know, they all talk about Adam Kedge at Albuquerque Academy. He talks about this that one of the biggest parts of their job beyond coaching on the track is recruiting. Like they're in the hallways hustling. And they have nothing to offer. They don't have a scholarship to offer. <laughs> they have a jersey to offer. That's what. That's the only thing they really have to offer recruiting in those hallways. But they talk about how important it is if you're going to have a big, vibrant program, you better be in the hallways. And that sounds a lot like college coaching. If you're going to have a big, vibrant college program, you, you better be in those high school hallways. <laughs> you better be on the high school tracks recruiting high school kids to your program. So yeah, I, 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 uh, I love how you said that, you know, convention is easy and curiosity is hard, you know, doing something different uh, is hard. It shouldn't be that it's different though. I think it, I think there should be more of a um, normalization of that. Certainly not everybody that coaches high school should coach college, by the way, I'm not sure every college coach should be coaching college. Maybe they should be teaching high school. I, I mean, in, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. just your own personality ways and things like that. So, and, uh, and I think Mike, it's certainly true that, you know, some, some really like, there is those people that are really, really well suited for the level that they're at. Right. Mm-hmm. Where like, I know some friends in the college coaching that it's like, this is where you need to be, mm-hmm. right? Like you really would, but and then and then I think the opposite is true mm-hmm. as well. So yeah, and, um, and that's hard, yeah. right? Because you know we you you brought in my one of my favorite topics, right? Ego and you know ego is good. That's what you know drives us to be better and things like that. It's bad ego and unhealthy ego. That's bad and unhealthy. And sometimes you know it's ego, bad ego gets in the way of our own self awareness of like oh, like I want to be at the power five level because that's who I think I am. And in self-awareness is like, oh man, but you know, I'd have a better life and be a better coach and therefore a better person if I was on the D3 level or if I was at the high school level or ran my own track club, et cetera. But that's hard, right? It's hard that that ego says, oh, I, I, that, that, that name and logo on my chest is who I am. When in reality, it's like, no, no, you're, you're, you're Matt, you're Mike, you're Joe, you're Cindy, you're Lisa. That's who you are first and foremost over the color of your shirt and logo uh, that deals with it. But yeah, that bad ego can get in the way there of of self-awareness. And it's really special when you find, that alignment, right? So you find your passion of coaching and you find the alignment of the right level and location and, you know, how it fits family and how it fits in your priority scale, really magical things happen. That may be, uh, what, what, what's his name? The new, new Barry, new, I'm going to, yeah, uh, Brosnan. It's going to be interesting 
that if he succeeds or fails, you, you get to define whether he succeeds or fails. If it's a misalignment of like, oh yeah, no, 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 you are, and this is no, this is not a hierarchy. Oh, you are an amazing high school distance coach. Like Brosnan, that's where you like shine and you really impact kids' lives and they go on to a, amazing schools because of the improvement you work for them. Colleges didn't work out because of the infrastructure of college and you have to set budgets and things like that that maybe you didn't have to do in the high school level. That does not make him a higher or lower coach. It just yeah. makes alignment hard to to perfectly 100% line up. And I think, yeah, I think context is like, it is a lot. In, in like, especially with your perception of that, those sort of levels, like I was, um, I, I was fortunate enough to, to, like, I grew up in Illinois. Right. And, uh, and when I left Illinois, I, I felt like, did I overblow this sort of like debt wilder stuff? And then I went back and I was like, nope, like this is, this is really legit. And so when you have some of the best high school, some of the best coaches in the country coaching at the high school level in the state that you're, that you're running in and competing against, um, it, it sort of like it really, really takes the um, and and also division right. Like I could go, you know, sixty sixty miles uh, west of where I grew up was Paul Olson. Sixty miles east of where I grew up was Al Carius, right? And so that breaks down the like oh division one. It's like oh like coach right? Like you're you're one of the best doing it. And so uh, uh, so so I think that some people that that context has shaped them to think that oh this is where I need to be or, you know, and, and I think that I was really fortunate to have amazing coaches at or, or around the area. And also that have coached me to sort of break that perception for me. And I think legally, when you're talking about Illinois and distance and cross country coaching and people, you have to say Joe Newton. I think we just have to give props when you talk about great people in the state of Illinois. I'm pretty yeah. sure I get dinged by someone if I don't mention the great Joe Newton as well. You already get, you, you checked off Alcarius. That was one as well uh, <laughs> that you just have to. You're not allowed to speak on Illinois distance without those two gentlemen. And there's many, many more as you alluded to. So how long at Greensboro? Was it all at you thought it was going to be moving from, you know, obviously a successful, fun high school program to the collegiate program. Did it, did it just suck? Was it great? Was it gold? Was it <laughs> pewter? What was it? <laughs> um, it was awesome because of the people, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was, uh, it, it was amazing. I think that, um, uh, so the, the head coach who was still there at the time was a former, uh, ops director at, at UAB and was incredibly good, like incredibly organized, really, really good with, with the day-to-day -day. taught me a lot about that side of things, um, which was important. And then, and then the, the team had some controversy, like a couple of years before I got there, right. There was some, um, I think some unfair sort of stigma surrounding the team. And that was just, I found that to be just not the case. Like mm -hmm. there was amazing, amazing people there, amazing athletes and loved each other. And were all sort of invested in each other's success. And um, I, I really liked it. Now the, the, what the reason it was so short there is we, we talked about this a little bit before. Um, I, it was flexible enough where I, I did not want to leave um, the church. I did not want to leave ministry full time. Mm -hmm. So I was sort of essentially working two full-time jobs. Right. Um, and it was a lot, a lot, a lot. Sure. And, um, and uh, I, I still like the, the head coach, like a after she was named, the interim tag was sort of off. Um, I had a lot of sort of thinking to do whether I was going to stay um, or not. And, and I, and it wasn't my job to have, I would have had to reapply for it in, in things too. So I don't want to make the perception that like it was sort of my job to have, but um, I was encouraged to, and, and, uh, and, and I, uh, at that point, I knew that this is what I wanted to do sort of full time. And, and it would have been really, I'll put it this way. Um, it would have been really, really difficult to make that work mm. um, with sort of my situation in life. And that really stunk because I love those people. Like I, I love being there and it was, it was awesome. But, um, but uh, I kind of needed um, that supplemental thing for, with the church to be able to work. And I knew that it wouldn't really be fair to the program if I wasn't able to give um, everything that I had to it. And, and I just, at the, as in the situation, like where we, we could have made that happen, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so luckily enough, I found a situation that was, that was able to make that happen, which was at Bart college, formerly Atlantic Christian college, um, working with, uh, uh, the head coach there, Tim Foster. So I was coaching the distance runners. He was coaching, um, the sprinters and we had a, a couple of volunteer assistants who were awesome people too. So, um, yeah. And, and, uh, but, but at the same time, that was, I was kind of, I was going down to, to Wilson, North Carolina, um, 
two times, sometimes three times a week, which was an hour and 50 minutes from my house. Mm. Uh, and uh, But the flexibility that allowed me to continue to, to work at the church made it work for my family a little bit better. Um, and uh, and um, yeah, had had an awesome experience there too. Like it's, it's track and field. Not, you don't, you know, you don't run into a lot of jerks. Our sport's amazing, right? And so um, I, I've been very, very fortunate to all the stops I've kind of had. It's been surrounded by a ton of people and, and really great people. What are you doing? So, you, you know, you're in the um, ecosystem now, right? UNC Greensboro, Barton College. Uh, what are you doing coaching education wise? So, you know, typically when we first get into coaching, we fall back to how we were coached, whether that's the quote unquote correct or incorrect way to actually coach. That's just what we know, right? So you had, you know, great high school um, experiences with Coach Thorpe. You had uh, different experiences with DePaul and Olivet Nazarene with some great people there. You mentioned, you know, Mike McDowell and of course Kyle Rego there is now, uh, who is married to. I'm going to call her my former athlete. She was a distance uh, runner, but when I was at Ball State, uh, Nicole Hartford, and it's so awesome to see, like, oh man, one of my athletes now married one of my my coaches. That's so cool. Uh, yeah. After they graduated and all that kind of stuff, um, so. Um, what, what are you doing to actually like, okay, I'm going to, I'm a coach. I, I, if I wanted my kids to be good and improve, I asked them to do extra things. What am I doing to actually improve how I coach? What are you doing coaching education wise? Yeah. So t- taking every opportunity I get um, to, to, to get certified in all the different event areas, but yeah. also so this is something that I learned to, from, um, from my, my high school coach um, is the ecosystem is so amazing that you can just call people, hmm. right? Like, and, uh, and I'm probably, um, man, I've annoyed some people by trying to get on their call list and trying to get <laughs> just, just 15 minutes with them. And, uh, and usually I'm, I'm, I can be a little, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I've said before, like, Hey, like this seems like kind of something to tell everybody. Like, I want to know the thing that you're not telling anybody. Like, I, I want to know your best ideas. Um, and, and the awesome thing is like coaches in our sport will spend the time with you. Um, and mentoring is such a vital part of uh, what it means to be part of the ecosystem. And so I haven't had like that one person that's like, oh, this is kind of the person that I go to for everything. But there are several different people that I'll, you know, pick up my phone and call. And I like to do it in a way that's uh, a little like I don't want to be cynical about it. Like I know there's some people out there like, oh, keep in contact because that person could give you an in the next job. Like I'm not about that. Like I'm really curious. Like I generally want to know. Um, and uh and something that's probably not good to say because this is being recorded is like, I have, Mike, I have no good ideas. Hmm. Like I have no good ideas. I think what I'm pretty good at is curating other people's, mm-hmm. you know? And so um, I, uh, I, I've really, really tried to, to be active and, and call everyone, right? Call this person. Oh, somebody's doing it better than, let's not have an ego and be prideful about it. Let's call them and find out how they're doing it and why. And so, um, so, so yeah, and that's, uh, that's, I don't know. That's just something that I'm, uh, uh, I'm, <laughs> well, I need to just pick up the phone and give somebody a call. What's been the like most mind blowing piece of advice you've been given and you, you can decide whether to, or not to share the person's name, but what was, you know, you, you seem to talk to a lot of people. I love your question of, Hey, that's great. Let's cause what you're doing is you're kind of peeling the onions. Like, yep. Okay. That's good. Yep. Okay. That's good. Yeah. What have you never told anybody? What do you not tell people? What do you only tell people who, you know, you know, are going to carry out this type of advice, this mentorship here. What's like been the most mind blowing? Like, Oh my goodness. I never thought of it this way. Um, yeah, I think, and I know this is going to, I don't want this to be super cliche, but I, it was really, really helpful for me early on here where I'm at right now um, is that like doubt is a feature, not a bug, you know, like um, you're every day you're going to think like, oh, this is not work. like, oh, this, I should be doing something else. You're, you're putting, and that's just what it means to be, to want to be a better coach is that, um, it, it comes from a real passion to, to, to get better and to win is that like, um, uh, like I mentioned to you before that I listened to your uh, podcast with Coach Brecker and it's like, oh, that guy's in my conference. Like I, I gotta, I gotta coach against that guy. Right. Like it's and so, so that whole, like, I've got to be doing it better and maybe I'm not fit for this or maybe I can't do this. Um, that's part of it. Like that's all in there. Um, 
and and it's not you know you shouldn't run from that it's like find sort of ways to to deal with that right and so that self doubt i think that as a coach and certainly i think as an athlete everyone experiences is a feature of this it's not a bug um this is something that everybody goes through even the best coaches in the world hmm. and so uh so that was that was really really helpful um just sort of general information the other stuff is sort of more like very technical sort of x and o stuff that i know that um i'll spare spare the listeners and give you <laughs> uh, for, for that hey, stuff for, um, for all you podcast hosts that do the x's and o's podcast jt ryan all you get a hold of them he'll, he'll spill his beans but you know we ain't talking about it on here so barton seems a little um i don't know if untenable is the right word because I don't want to be a negative connotation, but an hour and 50 each way, th those things don't typically last a long time for obvious, may maybe obvious reasons, but maybe unobvious reasons. H how long did that last and where did we go to next? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I think like I, I've really gave it, given my all to the places I've been. I will say just to be totally honest, it's like some of those decisions were to stay in the ecosystem until I could find Mm -hmm. a kind of tenable sure. situation. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, we, we had some success there and coached some, some lovely folks and, and really love my time with working with coach Foster. And, um, but, uh, uh, I, um, when I was originally thinking about going to Barton, I applied for, for the job here at, at Avery and they had done two searches and had some, and, and things just didn't work out for whatever reason. Sometimes it was, um, didn't work out in the end with Averitt. Sometimes the candidate didn't work out. And so uh, the initial time back when I was at UNCG and I knew that that wasn't going to work, I had applied. Mm. And so they reached back out in May and, hey, are you are you still interested in, in doing this? And and, um, and I almost, like, I knew kind of the challenge, right? I knew what it was. And, and uh, I was a little um, intimidated by it. And, and, uh, and also there was real fear of failure, which is awesome. It's like pretty, kind of excites me. Um, but so, so yeah, I was at Barton for, for the indoor and outdoor season and then, um, Averitt called, um, and, uh, and, and that's when I ended up sort of taking the, taking the job in, in late May uh, of this past, of this, of year. this job. Yeah. yeah of this this year. year. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So, right. so tell us about Averitt. This is, um, you know, we've heard of UNCG. I've heard of Barton, uh, yeah. Averitt maybe is, has escaped me in the past as far as a program. Right. So j just launching the indoor and outdoor track and field program. Um, what excited me about the position like was the, um, again, that curiosity piece, right? That, that bit about like, oh, this is going to be a little chaotic. Like, like this, can, this is going to be really, really difficult to kind of get this thing up and going. And, um, and um, that excited me about the position. I also have a really, really supportive, incredible administration staff that um, like when I was applying, Mike, I asked a lot of really hard questions. Like, are, are we, you know, are we serious about this? Do we want to be successful? And, and heard like, some scary things, but in, in a good way, right? Like, oh yeah, if you don't, if you don't win here, like your job is, you know, like, and that's, that's what you, that means that they're going to really put some, uh, um, you know, put, put some resources and some attention into the program. And, and I have not been, um, and, and that's, that's all been true. Like, and, and there's, there's real commitment to, to building this thing the right way and, uh, and growing the program and helping, you know, grow the staff as well. So, uh, yeah, we just also moved into the ODAC conference, which is kind of a historic division three conference, um, from the big South, which is an, another really, really, you know, high level division three conference. And, um, and, uh, and, and yeah, so doing a, a ton of hustling, it's, it's certainly a new experience and, uh, you, you don't know what you don't know, which is why that impulse to just pick up the phone and call as many people as you know, and ask them, you know, any question that you have is, is a good one here because, we are kind of, um, we're starting this thing, you know, it's, it's exciting. It's also, you know, a lot. So, uh, yeah. 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 yeah I, I think about a term called like blissful ignorance. <laughs> uh, cause this is kind of what I'm hearing the third time that you're kind of, um, traditionally woefully unprepared for the job but getting it done now it remains to be seen at Averitt, but uh, you know, when you first got into coaching uh, you became a head coach really quick on the high school level. Uh, there's no way. No, normally one of my 
my favorite questions to ask when someone becomes a coach head coach for the first time is were you ready and it's always the 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 honest ones are always like no no i didn't know i had to do x y and z right but you were just like all right i want to be the head coach uh and the former head coach's dad is going to be my assistant i don't know that i'm not supposed to do this let's go let's do it right uh first uh, very soon after you know, after having run that program very successfully you go into college coaching and it's like i don't, I don't know what's going on I, I, you know, i'm not i don't know that i'm not supposed to do this let's go, let's figure it out, you know, and, and have success there and at the next stop. And now, you know, to start a new program, that takes a, a, a different skill set than going into a program and keeping the success going or go into a program and rejuvenate it. Uh, Cause maybe it's, you know, it has fallen in some down times. This is brand new. There is no book for this. Like um, I don't think that at the USTF CCCA uh, convention, we're going to have someone speaking on how to start a new program. Maybe we should, um, Sam, I'm not sure if you listen, he's going to be on the podcast here next month, by the way. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I ask him about this. Um, but maybe that should be a, a, a topic of, of discussion, uh, of, um, a presentation. So now you're starting this program. You've never done this. Mm -hmm. How do you, I mean, I love that you're kind of like, eh, I'm just gonna figure it out and get it done. You know, uh, <laughs> that's good. You know, it's sometimes when we think we, we know how hard something is we, and we know we're not prepared for it, we don't even try. And so we don't even learn from it and, and have success or not have success from it. So how are you tackling this brand new program? Never had indoor and outdoor track and field. How are, what, what's kind of like, what were your, 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 you seem to be very, um, you know, obviously curiosity is a big part, but preparation seems to be a part like, okay, I'm going to uh, learn it on the job, but be prepared as, as, as have goals and things like that. What were kind of the, the top three things or are not, not were are kind of the top three things, you know, that you want to accomplish to help get the program, you know, going and going in the right foot, uh, right foot, right direction. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, the, the number one thing is at the division three level, we don't have to, I mean, I'm not saying other people do this. I'm just saying like, we really don't have to compromise on fit at all. Mm. Um, like the student athletes who want to come and run here and compete here want to do that. Like that's what they want to do. Um, there's not, uh, you know, there's not that sort of grant uh, um, money that, that we can give to student athletes to sort of tip them over the top. Right. They really have to believe in what we're doing. So um, that's the thing, right. Uh, recruit qualified student athletes and, and pitch it to them as like, they get to be a part of this, right? Mm. Exactly like what you said, right? Like, you know, this doesn't happen all the time. And so um, it's sort of like you get to plant vineyards that you may not enjoy the shade from. Mm. Um, but uh, but that that's that's the one thing, right? So like, as we're building, um, it's almost like when you accelerate the 400 meter, right? Like accelerate the right way um, so that you, you have enough to make it right to the finish line. And, and you're, you're also not, you know, have a ton of catching up to do. But surrounding us with really, really good, um, really good people who are culture people. Um, so, so that's the one thing. Um, the second thing is like we want to, we want to win and not be shy about that. Uh, and and the third thing is being incredibly organized because that's something that I really learned from Coach Roach at UNCG is um, doing the things you don't want to do on a Monday uh, allow you to coach on you know Tuesday through Saturday, uh, Tuesday through Sunday rather. Um, and so. I, I don't know. Somebody out there might think like expense reports are really great, fun. Um, I don't think that. Um, and, and as we're starting this program and um, sort of building a new track and field facility, like there's a ton of administrative duties that go on to that. And so being incredibly organized early on is what I owe to the student athletes who have trusted me enough to come run, run for us here at Avery is uh, so that I can pour into them those, those three, three and a half hours a day that I get to spend with them. Right. And um and so I, I, I think that's the, the three things, um, but it's also making our track and field team reflect the community um, is, is really, really important to me, right? White kids run track, black kids run track, Hispanic, everybody runs track, poor kids, rich kids, big kids, small kids, um, everybody runs track. And so um, I think that because usually programs are combined in some way, right? And it's men's and women's indoor, outdoor and cross country that a track and field team has a really unique opportunity to set the tone for the campus at the university, um, especially at like smaller liberal arts colleges, you know? Um, and that's really cool. Like that's a big responsibility, but it's also like, Oh, like our success and, and our flourishing really will have impacts on kind of main campus and, and how things go with the student body. And, 
And so uh, that's, that's sort of what excites me, but you're right. Like having credible people in my corner, um, coaches, uh, my family, right. Like community members is the, the, it's the only way this works. Like it's the only way it works. And, um, and so that's really, really unfairly relying on mentors and and Mm -hmm. former coaches and things. And in a way where hopefully I'll, be able to turn the favor because they've been so invaluable like they've been so incredibly valuable to to um even even my first three and a half months here so it's one thing to call these coaches and and be a pest as you kind of mentioned it about you know training and things like that (laughs) has there been anybody you know again it's a it's a small sampling of coaches who have started a program uh from scratch like we're doing here at Averett uh has there anybody has there been anybody you can kind of lean on ask questions hey I'm stuck here I didn't expect this issue how did you operate through anybody like that um, so, sort of, but like in pieces, you know, um, and not exactly, not in the same situation. Um, but, uh, I, I was on, uh, um, uh, I, I mentioned to you last time that like I was, I, I had the fortunate, uh, the good fortune to be on the, the same call with, um, coach Wilson, formerly at Minnesota, who mm. started at the, uh, um, you know, I, th- I think, I think the school when he started was an NAI school, but now it's an NCAA division, mm-hmm. division three school and had a ton of success before he went to the university of Minnesota. And, not the same, but certainly similar circumstances. And and I asked him sort of like, uh, "Hey, what what uh, like what do you, what should I be doing?" And the first thing he said to me was drinking, um, <laughs> as a joke, as a joke, right? <laughs> like joking, just to be clear. Um, and uh, and the, and he just gave me some some really really good advice, um, and and really helped me not be so anxious mm. about the process, right? And, and knowing that. Like a lot of those pressures that you feel early on, if you're a competitive person are from you and those are good, mm. but um, you're not going to be good right away. Like it's going to take a little bit of time. And so, um, and if you are anxious, your athletes will feel that anxiety and you'll carry that to your administration and everyone. So um, taking it hour by hour sometimes, you know, like taking it, you know, sometimes week by week, sometimes day by day, sometimes hour by hour uh, has been really a lifesaver, right? Like, cause you know, thinking about right, like the ODAC conference meeting, the outdoor track conference meeting in late April when mm-hmm. you don't have uniforms yet for your program. It's like you know, <laughs> like you know, <laughs> you gotta, um, you, you just have a good day today. Complete the things that you want to do today, and then go to sleep, and then wake up tomorrow and do that again, and do that over. It's it's very 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 much like being, a, I think, a successful track and field athlete. Mm. You know, not not a ton of tens and ones, a lot of sevens. Mm. Um, have have seven days um if you can do that you know consistently you'll, you'll be in good shape tackling the right issues but tackling them in the right order as well like you said i can't worry about outdoor conference right now i, I haven't even got my uniforms like that i gotta get that first and the next stuff well, are, are you guys bringing all the events uh, on campus from the get-go or are you staging it meaning you know sometimes a new program will say hey we're going to pause on pole vault and or hammer uh two of you know i'm the equipment guy here and i can tell you that's two of the more expensive events there are out there uh for different reasons but uh still the dollars add up there or are you trying to assimilate you know the whole 21 22 events where we have from the get-go uh yeah we're, we're going all in early on right mm-hmm. we're um I think I think part of it is because the the um, uh, the the uniqueness of the events that you mentioned will attract quality athletes to the Division three level who are just incredibly incredibly passionate about that. Like here's another way to say that there are just more cross country athletes than there are pole vaulters and hammer throwers, and so um, if there are people who want to come throw the hammer and are super passionate about developing that, that um, you know that that. Uh, it's a good fit for the university as well. Uh, we want to be able to have that as a, as a resource to attract some of those quality student athletes. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're all in, right? Like we, we got the facilities for it and, um, where we will have <laughs> in uh, January 1st. Um, and so we, we want to, um, we want to be, we want to be versatile as a program. We don't want to be distance only, or you know, we, we, we want to think about it in terms of, uh, you know, a holistic approach, film, film the events, but we're not in a rush to, to like, you know, look, we're not, we're not going to have athletes who run the five can be like, Hey, are you interested in throwing? Like, that's not mm-hmm. what we're about either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey, like, let's try to get 11, 
you know, 11 feet in the pole vault. Like mm-hmm. it's like, no, we're not, we're, we're trying to get um, specialists right in those areas mm-hmm. um, attracted to the university. So I hope that answers your question. So you, you, again, there was no playbook to do this, you know, almost you said, we don't have this at convention, things like that. What has been the biggest, knowing that you're on the job, I'm going to call it maybe your hundredth day. Like you have not been on the job all that long <laughs> when we're recording this. What has been like the most out of left field? I did not see this coming. I don't want to call it a struggle, but something you've had to overcome or you just didn't know, oh man, I didn't realize I was going to have to do X, Y, and Z. And I did it, but I did not see that one coming. Um, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> I think from what I've heard from some some very valuable sources is that usually when you uh, sort of build a facility, the above ground equipment, that kind of thing happens like at a similar time as that other stuff happens. And uh, and so those things were certainly get one thing done and worry about the other thing. And um and so a lot of uh, a lot of those things, and also it's a really helpful it's a really helpful reminder that um, track and field people are specific like it's a specific kind of language, right? Mm. And so um, there's some things that we take for granted mm. that people who are you know administrators, folks who are supporters of the program, may not be right. Like okay, so here here's an example of that, right? Like um, we are. Um, you know, it was an example about like sharing equipment, right? With um, the the high school program that we're going to be sharing our facility with. It's like, oh, do we need two new pole vault pits mm-hmm. so that we after practice every like this seems like we're tracked. We know like this seems very silly, right? But oh no, we are going to take the one and put it in a shed every day. And we're going to bring out the other. It's like that's like an honest general question, and, mm-hmm. and as much as. Um, you know, Gil might like us to purchase two pole vault pits. Um, we are probably, you know, mm-hmm. you know, obviously. So, so that's something that I just don't think is even a, like I just take that totally for granted. But when you're explaining these to folks who are helping purchase these things and fund these sort of projects, mm-hmm. that that's not their area at all. Mm-hmm. And so it's really like remembering what it was like when you were learning the sport for the first time mm-hmm. and taking people through that. So I think that's kind of the general sort of left field stuff mm-hmm. where it's. You know, some uh, you just don't know what you don't know, and um, and uh, and and that was the case for me too, right? Like so, uh, but that's that's always always a good reminder. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's but, that's super interesting because you, yeah. you just generalized all track coaches, but then you actually got to the real meat of it too, because you're like, well, me too, I don't know everything, right? Uh, that, that's something that you know we learn here as 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 sales professionals inside of our organization of, you know, we have our own little industry jargon terms because we're actually manufacturing. So we, you know, we, we know the product product maybe better than anybody else out there as compared to a coach, because like, I see it getting made. Like I know what goes into it, all these kind of things. I had no clue before I got here. I got, I'm so dumb. I thought pole vault poles. I'm like, Oh, they must buy like a 16 foot pole and chop it in half. There's two eight footers or something. Right. No idea. That's not that how it works. Not That's not. Okay. Close. It's quite okay. amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, if you go onto YouTube and search how it's made pole vault, it, it, they, they did a video. They, they came here in 08 for the uh, the Olympic year and actually filmed the entire process. It's fascinating. Even for the non pole vault, I was a non pole vaulter and I still thought it was fascinating. I still love watching those guys. But we have to like when, when we hire young uh, professionals here who are typically former af- former track athletes or former coaches, they come here thinking, oh everybody knows flex numbers for pole vault or everybody knows uh, the differences in pole vault pits or whatever, you know, the, the rim weights and discus. And it's like, "Mm, no, buddy, first of all, not everybody is full-time coach. And what I mean by that is like, they're, they're not geeking 24 seven, like, you know, guys like me and you are necessarily. Some people are like, yeah, yeah, I coach, but you know what? I'm a teacher. I'm a dad. I'm a mom. I'm a son. I'm a (laughs) brother. Maybe I'm, I'm a minister, (laughs) you know, like I have a lot of other stuff. Sorry. I don't know every little specific. So uh, I love that when you're talking to administrators, um, alumni, uh, fundraising uh, efforts that you, you, you don't have to necessarily assume zero playing field, but you, you, you almost have to ask like, oh, so how much do you know about cross country 
teams. Uh, you know, I, I ran, you know, the two mile once, Oh yeah. You know, we, we actually run the five mile and, you know, you, you got to get to that basis there. So I love that. Uh, one of the things that you have to learn there, uh, speaking with new administration, even new to you and new to the school of like, Hey, here, here's why we need this. Yes. We can get away with that over here on this, but here's why we can't get, get away with lower than this because of safety, longevity, whatever, you know, what we're going to do with our program, et cetera. So I love that. I love how you generalized everybody, but then brought it to the real answer of like, yeah, we're all kind of individuals here. Uh, and let's speak, speak our languages together uh, with that. Uh, well, Matt, as we start to wrap up, you know, I've said this in the podcast, I learned this from our CEO, David Hodge, who was a pole vaulter in college at Baylor and all this stuff. He's, he's, he was a big time athlete is, you know, healthy things grow, right? So like when new programs are coming online, new facilities, new coaches, like that's awesome. Cause that means we're growing, like something's healthy there. So we're growing. That's awesome. What's got you, you know, you're staring in front, you had those 10 tackles you've got to make and you've got to do them in order. What's got you excited about this upcoming year? I think that, um, you know, at, at Averitt, they've had a cross-country program for a while, and they, they don't have a super rich tradition in cost, but um, seeing the athletes, the very few athletes who are already on campus that were interested in running cross, or who were <laughs> cross, right? Um, the enthusiasm around sort of building the program and the, the total buy-in from the university to that is uh, has me, like, incredibly incredibly excited to see how excited they are right it's like they're like finally we're doing this like we're, we're, let's let's go um and i think i think the other thing is um i have a i i, I talked about um evan thorpe and you know evan's son simon is, is running the dixon program now and he's doing a really good job and he makes fun of me he calls this my complex um it's like uh so in a, in a good way we're very close uh but like um my uh, like my dad was a truck driver. My mom was a dispatcher growing up, and uh, from an incredibly hardworking uh, middle class family in the middle of Illinois, uh, and uh, and so what excites me is um, that uh, there's a real possibility that this thing fails, right? Like, uh, and and it it's going to take an a ton of really, really productive coordination and a lot of enthusiasm. And, and like you said, like, um, you know, sunlight and water <clears throat> to make the thing grow. And um, when you go to work every day and, and you think about like the kind of stuff that's riding on this being successful, it puts a really good kind of pressure on you. Mm. Um, and so that's, uh, and I'm a, I'm a really competitive person. Um, and so, so that's, that's what's uh, that's what's keeping me going, right? That's what's that's what's keeping me in the office and, and checking off those tasks. So, uh, yeah, it's it's um, it's a lot, but it's all worth it. You know, I, I'm always amazed that coaches who come to this show give us the time of day. And what I mean by that is you're so, so busy. <laughs> it's, it's quite amazing. The hardest part and you know, Matt, you and I worked through this and our past guest is the actual scheduling part. That's the hardest part of setting up these, these amazing interviews with coaches is actually figuring out your schedule with my schedule, et cetera. Um, and I'm really just thankful for you, my friend. So you know, uh, I'm going to call it a quote unquote normal coach. So like when you're at UNCG and uh, uh, Barton, it's like, oh, okay, well, there's things in place and, you know, you're busy and, and there's things in place. You're building those things today in place <laughs> at, at Averitt. So I'm just so thankful because I know how busy you are. Uh, I, I know how busy you are and I know how, and I don't know how busy you are. Meaning like, I know there's a thousand things. You're going to have a thousand emails when you get off the uh, call here. Uh, you missed so many calls already. You know, the kids that are on campus trying to figure out where their dorm rooms are the next recruit for next year the facility being built uniforms <laughs> i mean there's just so much the list is very long and i'm just so so grateful that you would give us really the most expensive thing you can give us and that's your time today man i think you know your story is important uh, I've used this analogy before and I'll continue to use this analogy. You know, if, if your journey in this great profession is a book, you might be, I'll say your chapter two. I was going to give you chapter <laughs> one, but your chapter two, but that's what's awesome about this is, you know, you're, you're barely, you're, you're, you know, they've maybe have called the runners to the start line for your career. You're, you're young, you're 30, you've got 
30 years to go minimum <laughs> in this great profession. Uh, and so, you know, you haven't even started been in the, you know, turning the bend here on the first curve of the 400, man. And that is exciting because you're writing your history. You're creating with what you're creating there at Averett, you're creating legacy. These first athletes, those are legacy builders. These administrators that made the right decision to add these sports, they're legacy builders. You leader, uh, being the leader of the program, running the captain of the ship, that's legacy building, my friend. And that is what is going to be exciting to see. You, you know, when someone listens to this podcast 10 years from now, and Averett has won conference champs and many All-Americans and, you know, kids are in the, the workforce and they're business owners and uh, pr probably coaches and things like that. They're going to look back and be like, yeah, go back and listen to that guy, his first year there and how he built this. That's what creates legacy. And that's the most exciting thing that I get from your journey uh, in this great profession, man, is the legacy that you're building at such a young age, man. This is great, man. You're doing awesome. And, and Mike, I, I really appreciate you too. I think, you know, I, I read all the time about the the burnout rate of um, track and field coaches and, and, and specifically young coaches. And I think uh, listening to the podcast a few times that I have now, now being on the podcast, it's a reminder like that there's, there's a real camaraderie out here, right? You're not alone. Um, we can, we can kind of, um, if, if we're willing to be leaned on occasionally, we can lean on each other. Um, we can lean on other people. And um, it's just a, a reminder of a, like a really, really special community that we have and we're lucky to be a part of in track and field. And, um, and uh, you're, you're certainly one of the, um, you, you, you speak with that community all the time. So I appreciate the work that you do here. And um, I, had a, I had a blast. This was a lot of fun. Awesome, man. Well, your story matters, man. And I'm just so humbled to be able to share that with our listeners. Uh, that's a wrap, folks, man. What a great story. I can't wait to see what gets built there, David. I mean, the, the program, the people, and again, we're in a people business. Uh, it, it's going to be quite amazing. I can't wait. I'm going to be doing this podcast 10 years from now. N not only do I'm going to do a follow-up with, with Matt, I'm going to be interviewing one of his athletes from this year's team because they're going to become a coach. I just know it. Uh, and I'm going to be like, yeah, you know what? I interviewed your coach before you even had a program, man. Uh, and it's going to be awesome. And again, that's to me, that's how you define legacy. Uh, so thank you for being here today. Uh, join us next week. We're going to have another amazing coach here. We'll learn about their journey in this great profession and we'll do it all over again. Thanks for being here. Have a good week.